My name is Allison Dundee Rentel, and I'm a professor of political science, anthropology, law, and public policy in the Department of Political Science and International Relations. So I represent our department. And this event is very exciting for me as I specialize in human rights and recently joined the Council on Foreign Relations. And I joined in order to try to help make human rights more central to foreign policy. So it is really my great pleasure this afternoon to introduce our distinguished visitor, Ambassador Labranidis, as well as my distinguished colleague, Kami Akavan. And just let me say a little bit about their backgrounds and then a few words about the European Union and human rights. His Excellency Stavros Labranidis has been the European Union's Union Ambassador in the United States since March 2019. From 2012 to February 2019, he served as the European Union Special Representative for Human Rights. In 2011, he was Foreign Affairs Minister of Greece, and prior to that, he had many high-level positions in the European Union and in the Greek government. So we're very honored to have him here with us today. Kami Akavan is the Executive Director of the Center for the Political Future and has worked with me and my colleagues on many programs, and he's such a delight. Uh, he joined USC after serving as the CEO of ProCon.org, the nation's leading source of nonpartisan research on controversial issues. And we did a program on tribalism that was quite exciting. I'd like to say just a few words about the importance of the European Union at this juncture. As I'm sure you know, the European Union has been a champion of human rights of all kinds, civil and political rights, as well as economic, social, and cultural rights, and especially the rights of migrants through important decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, like Hersey v. Italy. There's much more support in Europe for economic rights than in the United States, and there have been these key rulings vindicating the rights of migrants. But the relationship between the United States and the European Union is critical right now because of the role of the European Union supporting Ukraine in the invasion, uh, in dealing with the invasion by Russia. Ambassador Labranidis has been an outspoken critic of the illegal attacks on civilians, healthcare facilities, and schools, and these are blatant violations of international humanitarian law. As you probably know, President Putin's actions uh, are so blatantly in, in violation of international law that last week the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant so he could be tried for war crimes. And the European Union has supported European uh, democracy and human rights. And in an, in an essay he wrote about the role of the European Union, he, he's indicated that 1.3 billion euros have been allocated for this in 2014 to 2020. And I was really impressed with an essay that he wrote on uh, that's that's a, called a positive narrative, um, a positive narrative on human rights. It's an incredibly thoughtful essay that was published in the European Union's new foreign policy uh, edited collection, in which he makes a strong case for including human rights in foreign policy. He says, "quote Human rights is not a footnote in our foreign policy. It's not soft politics." It is hardcore foreign policy as far as we are concerned, because in fact, preventing those major conflicts or resolving them once they are, is hugely important for the security of Europe. So this is a huge, welcome change in foreign policy to make human rights central to this. Um, there are other topics that I'm sure we're gonna wanna touch on to do with um, energy policy, uh, coordinating COVID policies between Europe and the United States, but I'm gonna leave that to my colleague, Kami. I, I just wanted to say that we are so delighted that the ambassador has joined us today. We're very much looking forward to hearing his remarks. Please join me in this now sunny day in giving him a warm welcome <laughs> to USC. Thank you, Allison, for those uh, fabulous opening remarks. Folks, if you have not already read Dr. Rontel, is one of the foremost authorities on human rights here, not only in Los Angeles, but across the country. Her book, International Human Rights, a Survey, is really a must read, so I'm, I'm shamelessly plugging her book. It's fantastic. Uh, and thank you, uh, Allison, for that wonderful welcome. And of course, welcome to the ambassador. We are delighted to have you here, not only in Los Angeles, but on 
the USC campus. Uh, we have a lot of questions for you, limited time, so folks, I'm just gonna jump right in. Uh, my first question for you, and we'll pass the mic, by the way, we'll pass the mic back and forth. And so this, so this doesn't work. This does work, so our, our lapel mics are for our virtual audience. We have a virtual audience watching on Zoom as well as on Facebook, and this is being video recorded for YouTube as well as audio recorded for the Bully Pulpit podcast. Uh, so there's a- So I should be careful what I say. Yes, yes, careful what you say, That that's correct. Uh, and also, I want to say that we will have time for questions and answers. So as we're having discussions and you think of something you want to ask, write it down or remember it. And so we'll have, you will have an opportunity to ask those questions. Uh, my first question for you is, what was your first job in politics? And how did that first job that you had in politics influence your life in politics? OK. Um, so just ask that outside in a, in, a, in a little video that we did. The, um, I'd say my first real job in politics was being elected the president of the student council of the boarding school in my high school. So I was, I, I was a boarder in my high school. My, my parents died when I was very young. And I, but I was from Athens. I was from a well-off family. Uh, the boarding school itself was filled with kids from all over Greece. Um, really exceptionally bright kids, but uh, not particularly rich ones, which is why they would come and they would stay there. So um, I had to, from the first moment I stepped foot there, uh, I had to learn and understand where people coming from entirely different backgrounds than mine um, came, what they felt, what their issues were, how my country was so much more diverse than I thought it might be. Uh, and I realized that um, being able to exercise that empathy was what allowed me eventually to be elected president of the, uh, of the, uh, of the boarding uh, school. Uh, it was a political process because politics in Greece back then in the, um, you know, uh, 70s, but also since, um, permeates everything. Uh, and uh, it was, um, so I was not a member of the most popular political party in Greece at the time, uh, but I was a member of a political party, virtually everyone was. Um, and, uh, and when you ran for election, even as president of your boarding school, uh, everyone knew who you belonged to. So in some ways I had to overcome the fact that my party wasn't the most popular one in addition to everything else uh, to be elected. So. Uh, I'd say that that taught me um, uh, more than anything else uh, that if you're running out there simply to promote yourself, um, don't do it. You're dead in the water anyway politically. Um, if you're doing it because you you really care about trying to to bring together different elements of any particular community, uh, which is what you had to do back then. Uh, and to do so effectively and in a way that everyone feels empowered by it, uh, you know, give it a try. Uh, well, I appreciate that answer very much. And it, I think in a way you partially answered my next question. So great job of foreshadowing. Um, uh, I would say from that initial experience as a student leader, you've obviously gone on to some really incredible positions from foreign minister of Greece to the EU special representative for human rights uh, to your current role as the EU ambassador to the United States. Uh, and I'm just curious because we have a lot of students who aspire to these roles as well. What has made you so successful in international politics? You mentioned empathy, but I'm sure there's, there's a formula or recipe or certain traits yeah. that you as a leader possess. And I'm curious if you could articulate what those are, and where does that magic come from? Okay, well, <laughs> well, I mean, you guys really want to do what I did in my life? Who wants to be Greek? Who wants to be Greek foreign minister? Raise your hands. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll tell you what I, 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 I'll tell you what I, I learned. I, I don't know if this is why um, uh, you know I've, I've done all the jobs I've done, but. Um, the first thing I've done in all my life is that I've gotten a job and I've done the job. So I've never tried to get a job in order to get another job. And if I could advise you something here, because you're still young at this time, figuring out your lives, those of you who are students, 
please try not to think of everything as a stepping stone to something else. Try to do it well. If you're not willing or interested to do a particular thing well, don't do it. Just don't do it. You're doing yourselves no favors. You will not be happy in it. And you're doing no one you're supposed to be serving any favors. The second thing I would say that I always did, and I found it very useful in my jobs, although they're very political, is that I never ignored the ants' work that is required to be able to get anything politically important done. And by this I mean, if you're going to get into politics just because you have some great ideas, and you think you're going to be expounding on them and talking to people and hopefully making them really happy and enthusiastic about what you have to say, um, but you have absolutely no thought about how you actually apply them, how you make a difference, again, I would tell you, don't do it. And the ants' work is real hard. The good idea is about 10% of what you do and the 90% of actually getting it done. You know, I, I studied in the States, and then I worked as a lawyer in the States until I was about 30 years old. And then the, the, uh, I went back at a, at a late stage in life to serve in the Greek army. Every Greek male has, had to serve. But I had not been in Greece for many, many years in the in-between. And, um, and what I found really amusing, to be honest with you at the time, which is something I didn't really find in the States that much uh, then, uh, was that there were huge arguments usually you know, over beer or in a cafe or something like that, about who thought about something first. Well, I thought, I, I said this 10 years ago. Oh, this is my idea. There were never huge arguments about who did it first. So I actually did it first. And I always felt that it's supremely important to be proud about certainly your thoughts, but fundamentally what you've done. So Maeve, who's here from my office, knows that it's very, very frustrating for her. Um, how, what a stickler for detail I am. I mean, I have to deal with Ukraine, I just I mean, many, many issues every day. But I also have to send notes back to Brussels reporting on everything that we do and, you know, things and, and, and all that. And I get the most important ones of them. And they have been checked by three or four people before they get to my desk. And boy, oh boy, is everyone really, really embarrassed when they get it back with about a thousand things that I caught, a thousand, you know, from typos to a, you know, non sequitur to something, this, that, the other. And maybe that's my experience from being a lawyer. You can't escape that. But what I have found is focusing on details. As time-consuming as it may be, or as insignificant as it may be, it may seem to someone who thinks that, well, you're the foreign minister, you're actually spending time looking at this. Focusing on details gives you, makes you much better at focusing on the big picture as well. Do not assume one is one or the other. Whenever I sit down and I read something carefully, I take the time to rethink what is in there. Do the same thing with your papers. I can give you any advice, for example, here at USC. You know, you write a paper, you think it's good. You read it a second time, and you change a couple of things. You think it's done. It's not. Read it a third time. Try to really, really approach it from the viewpoint of someone who doesn't know at all what you're talking about. Think how they would receive it. I bet you will make more changes. Be careful with the details, because that will allow you eventually to do the big politics, if that's what you want to do. Uh, you saw me writing down all of your responses so I can apply them. So it's not just your idea. I can, I can actually uh, do it. Uh, so thank you for that response. That's, that's very interesting, and I appreciate the insights into your leadership styles. Um, I want to uh, move now to the current area of your, your work, uh, and this is EU-US relations. And this is a very broad question uh, for you. So I'm wondering in, in a few minutes, if you can, uh, can you describe the current status of the US-EU relationship, and in what direction do you see it trending, and why? So um, I would say that my focus is, and I think the current status of the EU relationship, EU-US relationship, uh, thankfully, uh, jives with that, um, to be able to maximize for American citizens and European citizens the benefits of an indispensable partnership 
that is based on the two strongest open economies in the world, um, the, and the two biggest values sharers in the world when it comes to democracy, open societies, rights. Um, it's not an easy relationship when it comes to economics all the time, because indeed we are the two biggest economies in the world, open free ones, uh, and we compete in the world. Our companies compete. At the same time that they do so, and sometimes there are complaints on both sides of the Atlantic about unfair competition or the U.S. closing its market or discriminating against Europeans or Europeans uh, closing their market discriminating against Americans, the vast, vast majority of that economic relationship is supremely beneficial. In this country alone, about seven to eight million jobs are being created by European Union company investments. That is more than any other investment in this country combined from all over the world creates. In Europe, similarly, about seven million jobs created by American investments in Europe. And what many people don't know is that this doesn't happen in spite of the European Union, it happens because of it. Fundamentally what the European Union did is it knocked down borders between 28 independent countries that allowed for goods and services and people and finance to flow freely without any impediment whatsoever. And that turned 28 small country economies into one huge economy of 450 million people. So my, what we have been doing in the past few years is to find ways to discuss with each other how it is that we can make that relationship stronger, okay? Now, the values element of it is also uh, huge. And in some ways, it connects with the economic element. If you think about it, in a container, and some port here in Los Angeles or in Europe, that you put a good to export it somewhere, in that same container you also put in the values that made that good. You don't see the values, you see the good. But Americans and Europeans do not produce goods by destroying the environment. We do not produce goods by violating labor rights. We, in fact, make sure that the goods that go in any particular container happen to get there because they competed with other similar goods in the context of open economies that allow the best product eventually to win. We don't pick and choose as governments what good was, goes in what container. And those values that go with those goods in those containers, when those goods get uploaded in some port anywhere else in the world, those values are with those goods as well. Now, as we put our values in our containers, other countries increasingly put their values in their containers. And those values also go to different parts of the world. And I'm thinking, for example, you just one example, and I'll stop here the answer because, you know, I can go forever, but look at Xinjiang in China. And look at the cameras, the way that cameras and artificial intelligence is being used fundamentally to be able to survey millions of people on the basis of their religion and to determine which one of them are good citizens and which one of them are dangerous back citizens on the basis of voice recognition and face recognition and movement recognition and all those things. In Europe, we have absolutely banned that kind of use of AI. When we send a camera somewhere in the world, we make sure it's not used this way. So our values go in those containers. But it will make a huge difference in the world in many countries around the world where everyone else exports, whether or not our goods and our values are there. Because if they're not, we're going to be facing a very, very different world than the one that you're seeing today. And that is something that I'm very focused on, including on how I interact with the U.S. administration, Congress, states at state level to make sure that that conversation goes. Uh, 
I appreciate, and to Dr. Antel's point, uh, you incorporated values along with the goods. And so my next question really focuses on values. And for many of us, we've seen this information in the U.S. The latest polls that I saw uh, showed that about 40 percent of the Republican Party believe that the U.S. has given too much aid to Ukraine. About 15 percent of the Democratic Party believes that we have given too much aid to Ukraine. Uh, the EU does not appear to have anywhere near that level of internal division about support for Ukraine. And so my question is, why is the U EU so supportive of the Ukrainian people in their defense against Russian aggression? And how do you think the United States has been doing as an ally in that defense? So let me start with, with, with Europe. Uh, I mean, obviously, Ukraine is a European country. Uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine um, is, and he said it, uh, a prelude of a broader imperialistic vision of bringing back the Russia uh, that existed under the Soviet Union. He's very, very upset, in fact, openly so, uh, that that Soviet Union uh, was uh, collapsed in a way that independent countries were created. Um, virtually, well, most of them having now joined the European Union itself. And the Consul General of Lithuania is here as well. She heads uh, a Consul General's network here in Los Angeles, and, uh, and she comes from one of those countries. Um, now, but of course it all comes from the European history, which goes much deeper than that, it goes to the Second World War. Um, we came out of the Second World War, that's when the European Union in its first iteration, in fact, was created. After Europeans um, killed each other, families killing families across Europe, and after Europeans committed arguably the biggest human rights violation of recent times, the Holocaust. And coming out of that, we Europeans made a decision, a historical decision, a defining decision, that we would never, ever allow ourselves either the means or the desire to perpetrate such atrocities against us or anywhere else in the world. Now, Mr. Putin today, but also the Russia after the Second World War, turning into the Soviet Union, made an entirely different decision, that it will continue using force to expand, and today that it will bring us back to the bloody days of the past as a paradigm of how international politics should be run. So might is right, is what Mr. Putin is telling us. Not international law, not international rules. And there are many countries around the world that are very, very concerned if the UN Charter gets trashed in addition to his effort to trash and kill uh, the Ukrainian people. Because everyone has some neighbor next door who maybe has more guns and be more than happy to impose their will on others. So this is existential, not just for Europeans, but for everyone else. And I have to say this, I get it, I understand. It's been a year of this war. It is very, very difficult for a year to be focusing on such a terrible, terrible story. I understand some people saying, I've had enough of that. I, I, I can't take it anymore. It's really painful. I get it. And I do know that this war is happening thousands of miles away from the United States. But I'll tell you one thing, and please mark my words on this. There's no safe distance, no safe distance when an autocrat sitting on nuclear weapons is convinced that he can bend the will of our leaders and our people through force to his own. Because if he succeeds, this is a very different world than the one that we know. America's and Europe's capacity to project our democracy and our power around the world will be destroyed for decades to come. This is not a war that is far away. And when I talk to Congress, I have to tell you, I am very, very pleased that across political lines and parties, the leadership in Congress is adamantly in favor of supporting Ukraine because they get it. And they also get, because some people also, I've heard some people say, we don't care about Ukraine, that's a European issue. China, on the other hand, we care about China. Really? Do you think China cares about Ukraine? You betcha. Do you see President Xi visiting President Putin the past couple of days, fundamentally to support? They care. 
and they do want to create an entirely different axis, and they do want Putin to win. They're putting their chips in Putin winning. So please, please, in intelligent discussion, do not tell me you care about China, but you don't care about Russia and Ukraine. Don't make that argument. I appreciate your words and your support very much. Um, the coalitions can be tricky, and my next question for you really is about that, and let's talk a little bit about the United Kingdom. Uh, so, Really? <laughs> yeah. So, for uh, the United Kingdom has had, I think, a pri five prime ministers from 1979 to 2016. That's, I think, uh, five prime ministers in 37 years. Uh, since Brexit, there have been six prime ministers. That's six prime ministers in seven years. And my question is, what has been going on in the United Kingdom, and how does this proposed Windsor framework help to bring the United Kingdom closer to the European Union? Yeah. Well, it's a very good question, but in terms of what's happening in the United Kingdom, I'd more than happy to talk to the, to the British ambassador in Washington and suggest that she visits and you can have a conversation. Um, the, the Windsor framework uh, is a very, very important step forward. Um, because fundamentally, so that's an agreement that the, that the president of the European Commission reached with the British prime minister uh, just a few weeks back. Um, for the full and effective application of the withdrawal agreement, which is the, in a sense, a divorce agreement that the UK signed with the EU when they decided to leave after Brexit, right? There have been a tremendous amount of discussion within the UK, mostly itself, uh, on on Brexit and how to to apply it. Um, uh, we uh, uh, we talked to the people in Northern Ireland. Um, Anyone here connected to Northern Ireland or to Ireland? Anyone Irish? One. Well, that's the first time, too, that there's so few Irish people in a room, I have to say. The, uh, as a Greek, I always thought I, you know, I had a great diaspora community here until I met the Irish. Uh, but, but how many Greeks in the room? Okay, glad. I see we're three to two. Um, the, um, so, um, it was very important when, when, uh, when the UK left that two things happened. The first thing was that the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, the agreement that was reached uh, in Northern Ireland um, about ending the decades-old conflict uh, there, um, that that agreement that eliminated the borders within Ireland would be fully respected. In other words, that a new border would not be created in the island of Ireland, breaking up the island in two. Because that could bring back a lot of those memories and a lot of those of that violence. So that was the first thing. The second thing was to ensure, at the same time, and that was the difficult thing, that was squaring, squaring the circle in a sense, to ensure that now that the UK was not a member of the European Union, that the goods that would come from the UK into the EU would be checked to ensure that they met the standards that the EU has set in its single market, standards the UK, of course, had adopted while it was a member of the EU. But how do you do this without having a border separating Ireland, which is a member of the EU, from Northern Ireland, which is a member of the UK. And that was the whole consternation and difficulty. The Windsor Protocol now puts in place an, an agreement that would allow for a great facilitation of trade between the UK and Northern Ireland, uh, for goods that are intended for consumption in Northern Ireland, uh, deals with a bunch of other issues. Uh, it's not yet adopted into law, either in the EU or the UK, so I, I think we should let the process move. But I'm very optimistic that the relations between the UK and the EU uh, will become much stronger, as they should be, as they are today when we deal with Ukraine, by the by, um, in the years to come.
Uh, well, thank you for that answer. I have two more questions for you, and then uh, whatever questions you have, we're eager to, to hear them as well. I want to go back to human rights. You remain one of the world leaders on human rights issues, and the special representative of the European Union for Human Rights, that was a position that did not exist prior to your taking it. Uh, you were the, its inaugural leader. Uh, clearly, you're still deeply involved in, in human rights issues today. And I wanted to ask a very open question and say, can you give us a few examples of human rights issues today that you especially want this audience to understand? Hmm. Uh, so, the first thing I would say about human rights that people might have to understand is that human rights are universal. That means, and interconnected, that means that what the United Nations and all the countries recognize as human rights, which are civil political rights and economic, social, cultural rights, that those things go hand in hand. You cannot be a government that says, I'm getting many people out of poverty, and therefore, um, you know, that's great. Uh, at the same time, though, I do not recognize freedom of expression. Um, uh, as, uh, as a right, and you cannot be a, a government that says, um, you know, uh, I am all in favor of uh, free speech, uh, but, uh, you know, I do not, uh, you know, recognize uh, social rights or the rights of, uh, of, uh, of others different than me in any particular community to thrive economically or otherwise. Um, now, there's a big narrative out there by those who violate human rights ideologically, they believe in the violation, they don't like it, that somehow human rights are not universal. In fact, they are Western, they are a Western concept. So they are trying to put it in a cultural context, and that's very, very dangerous. Because, of course, if you try to portray human rights as something that is not part of your culture, it's part of a bad Western culture, you're automatically undermining the universality, which means then you really don't have human rights law. Anyone can pick and choose what rights they want to apply and what rights they don't want to apply, and then we're back to ground zero. Or, in fact, maybe I decide that killing someone in my society because they are black or white or yellow or whatever is okay because, you know, that's not something that I have a problem with. But I will defend some other rights that I consider to be important. You can. They're universal. And they've always been so. Human rights have ne never, ever been a battle between different cultures or between different political systems. Uh, or between, um, you know, different regions of the world. There have always been a battle within them. If you are a woman being abused by your husband in Los Angeles or in Athens or in Moscow or in Beijing or, I don't know, Johannesburg, you'll probably never stand up and say to me or to anyone else uh, trying to intervene on your behalf, oh, please don't intervene. Human rights, are, uh, you know, are not universal. Uh, let me be abused. She is the powerless. She's the victim. The husband doing the abusing will very often tell you, oh, we have a special culture here, a different understanding of things. You have no right to intervene. He is the powerful. He is the abuser. Human rights is the universal language of the powerless against the cultural relativism of the powerful in any religion, in any culture, in any region of the world. Second thing I want to tell you is human rights are by design, nevertheless, and that's interesting, relatively unpopular. Think about it. Take freedom of expression, the First Amendment, right? Virtually every constitution in the world contains some provision. Now, if everyone in this room agreed, would anyone stand up and say, you know what, hey, let's, let's have a freedom of expression provision in our constitutions? No. We just agree. You know, it's fantastic. We hold hands, sing kumbaya, go home. It is when you disagree with someone, and when you disagree strongly with someone, and when someone has the power to silence you, that's when you usually sit back and say, wait a second, I need a freedom of expression provision. So if you think about it in its inception, freedom of expression is designed or was thought about in order to protect the minority very often view, the view of someone who can be repressed for expressing it. So, arguably, the unpopular view. Isn't that interesting? So why do major democracies defend unpopular views? Isn't the, isn't, isn't the majority supposed to rule in a democracy? No. 
yes or no. In democracies, we have determined that democracy begins at the ballot box, doesn't end there, that anyone elected has to be able to take into account everyone in a, in a particular society, not, not just people who are like them or who they like, but everyone. And frankly and fundamentally, to all those who used to tell me when I traveled around the world that why are you raising all these unpopular issues, uh, Mr. Lambrinidis, you know, about gay rights and all that stuff, look at our uh, societies. Eighty percent of our people don't like, uh, you know, gays. That's what the polls say. Why do you raise the issue of the death penalty? Ninety percent of our people love the death penalty. You know? My, my answer to that was, you know what? I'll tell you why. Because we are all minorities. In this room, maybe, I don't know, by gender, I suppose the majority is, I don't know, something. But if you were to be in that majority and feel that because in that majority at that particular moment you could actually pass laws or do things against others who are not that majority, think again, because in that majority you are at the same time a minority. Maybe because you're a, your religion is a minority in that majority. Maybe because the color of your skin is a minority in that majority. The moment you open up the door to discrimination and hatred on the basis of what, who's popular and who's, who's not in any particular setting, you're opening the door to hell for you as well. We're all minorities. Third thing I would say, whereas human rights are universal, Not every country in the world is at the same level of applying them. So whereas culture is not an excuse for violating rights, culture is something that has to be taken into account. Those of you who study or will study human rights will come across the Vienna Declaration at some point in the, in the late 90s. You will see a special provision in there that recognizes that there are different cultures. In, 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 in around the world, but it doesn't recognize them in order to say that, therefore, every culture can decide what right is right, but it recognizes them in the context of saying every culture has to apply all human rights, but it has to do it and it has to be approached, uh, recognizing that they may be at different levels of reaching that point. I mention this because it's very important in our discussions as well to understand that in many ways, human rights, and that's a difficult thing for me to say, a difficult thing for me to, when I was discussing with people around the world who, I, who, who, who were saying some really, I mean, who were really prejudiced against people because of different elements. Human rights, because it's law, tells you fundamentally, mostly, how you can or cannot act. It does not tell you how you can or cannot feel. Bear with me. You cannot kick me, kill me, imprison me because I'm Greek. You may not like Greeks for whatever reason. You cannot do those things to me. But do you have a right not to like Greeks? The answer to that is yes. Now, I will try to change your mind especially because hatred, if promulgated because of prejudice, can result almost automatically to violent actions as well. But you're entitled to your feelings. And we have to understand, those who do human rights, that there are people out there who may tell you things you don't like, but who can be convinced not to act against you because you are the kind of person that they don't like. But they want to feel that they have the right to be able to express those feelings. It's a very, very fine and difficult line. But whenever I've been around the world and I felt that people were telling other people, you cannot say this, you cannot think this, you cannot feel this, I would lose an audience who was not necessarily committed against not doing the things they're not supposed to do, right? Final point, I will tell you. I'm sorry, it's a long answer, but you know, you asked me in something that I really feel very, very strongly about. Listen, guys, when I go around the world, I, 
and I met with government officials and others, when every other argument failed, there were two arguments they would eventually use, trying to essentially shut me up. The first one would be, um, Mr. Lambrinidis, we are, remember now that's in the mid-2010s, right, early to mid-2010s, ISIS, terrorism is a huge issue. Mr. Lambrinidis, why do you come here with the luxury of human rights? Why are you raising an issue when we are trying to do huge things here? We're, try, we're trying to fight terrorists. We're trying to bring people out of poverty. And, you know, in that process, of course, you know, maybe we, you know, th throw some pro protesters in jail we don't like and all that stuff. But, you know, that's small potatoes. I mean, why are you poisoning the well of our relationship by raising those luxury issues of human rights? So a human rights a luxury was the first question I would they would ask me. And I, I would answer them. I would say, you know what? Let me answer you that question with another question. My question is, what's so scary about smart girls? Why did Boko Haram in Nigeria, major terrorist organization, decide to abduct 300 girls from school as opposed to bombing one more army barracks they're good at? In Pakistan, why did the Taliban plant a bullet in Malala Yousafzai's head, trying to kill her? when she was advocating for girls' education. In Iraq, why did ISIS abduct and forcefully marry and kill so many Yazidi girls? What's so scary about smart girls to terrorists? And my answer to that was obvious. Smart girls tend to become educated girls. Educated girls tend to become empowered women. Empowered women change entirely the balance of power in any society. And the last thing a terrorist wants is empowered society. They want societies with big black holes of power that they can fill in with their hatred and with their violence. So I would tell them, you want to fight terrorists, educate girls and boys, educate. Don't tell me human rights is soft policy. Look at what terrorists hate. They hate girls' education and rights. They hate freedom of expression. They hate freedom of religion. They hate those things. They kill to make sure those things don't happen. If you want to fight terrorists, make sure that you fight to defend all those rights. And those are human rights. They are telling you with every attack what they hate. The second thing they would ask me was, who are you to talk? Who are you to talk, Mr. Lambrinidis? Look at Europe, migrants. You have issues with migrants uh, coming in. You have racism and xenophobia going up. And I would say to them, OK, why are you asking me this question? You're not really asking me this question because you want me to admit I'm not perfect in human rights. You're not perfect in human rights. And then we sit down together and we try to fix our problems, right? You're asking me in order to tell me, essentially, Hey, look, you're imperfect, I'm imperfect, let me do my thing, you do your thing, and we are, you know, we part ways, right? And that's not okay. Because in fact, perfection is not the litmus text for human rights. No one is perfect. If that were the litmus test, then okay, no one's perfect, we're done. But the litmus test for human rights is, do you have in place, in your society, in your country, those institutions that will not allow you to shove your human rights imperfections under the carpet? In other words, do you want to become perfect, although you're not? Do you have independent courts that will try a policeman who killed a peaceful protester and condemn them? find them guilty even if the police chief themselves or the prime minister of the country doesn't want that to happen. Do you have civil society organizations you may not agree with? Hell, when I was running human rights, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, every NGO would come to my office, and it was rarely to tell me what a great job I was doing. It was usually to tell me that I'm just, you know, messing something up. And many times I disagreed, but you know what? Other times I agreed I could do better. They were keeping my feet on the coal. Or do you shut NGOs down, as now Putin is doing with the last straw memorial back in Russia, one of the most respected, greatest human rights organizations in the world, certainly in Russia? Do you have independent press? in your country, 
that can raise human rights violations and issues without a threat of them being shut down or bought out by an oligarch or thrown in jail? Do you have ombudspeople that can check, check and balance power? If you have those institutions, you can talk. So I see it as a tremendous amount and responsibility for us, the Europeans, when we talk about human rights around the world, to be ready more than anything else to support countries that are sitting on the fence to build those institutions up. Because make no mistake, there are some countries that are committed against human rights they will never change, or probably never change. There are some countries committed for human rights they will never change, or probably never change. But there are over 100 countries in the world sitting on the fence. And if we, if we don't find the right way to be able to convince them that human rights is the way to go, they're listening to either sirens now. And if we lose them, we lose the world game. That is a real danger. So long answer to a very short question, but these are some things I would like you to think about when it's about human rights. Yeah, I think that is applause worthy uh, to hear from one of the world's leaders. Uh, that was, that was a fabulous answer. Thank you. Uh, so I have one more question, and then we want to hear your questions. And uh, I kind of want to end on, I'll say, an optimistic note here. And it's really just to ask about uh, going back to the young people. We're at a un on a university campus here, and. Uh, you gave some advice to young people. I wanted to frame it this way. What's your advice for young people who want to get involved in international politics, but are dismayed or discouraged or overwhelmed by corruption, bureaucracy, bad actors, and the seemingly insurmountable complex problems that face our planet? What advice do you have for them in the face of all that? Why should young people get involved in politics and public service? You shouldn't, is my answer, unless you're burning inside to do it. It ties a little bit with what I told you at the beginning, in my view at least. When you ask some, someone, what are you doing? Right, so what are you doing here in, in, uh, at USC? Uh, you probably, everyone is able to answer me. I, you know, I'm studying politics. I'm studying something like that, okay. If I ask you, how are you doing it? How are you approaching this endeavor, this subject matter? I bet you fewer people will be able to answer. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I read a lot of books. I think that reading is, is a big deal. Or I, I don't like books. I, I like discussions in classroom. Or, you know, but I'm not sure. But you know, anyway. Or what are you going to do, you know, uh, with with your life afterwards? I have some idea and all that stuff. The toughest question to answer is why? Why are you doing it? Why are you studying politics? Why do you want to be a senator? Why do you want to be a lawyer? You have to answer your why is what my answer to this question would be. Because I have met a lot of really smart people with no why, with no moral compass. And I have absolutely no respect for ambition that is unmoored from a moral compass. I've seen too many smart, ambitious people, frankly, screw up the world. So if that's who you are, if your why, in fact, is I want to, you know, I, I, you know, I, I want to make a lot of money. That's why. I would ask you then why. Why do you want to make a lot of money? Answer me that question. Oh, because I want to have a lot of nice things. Why? Why do you want to have a lot of nice things? What's the big deal about having a lot of nice things? Keep asking the why. If you are lucky, eventually you may actually land into something that jives with your why and makes you happy. And if that happens, you will be able to change, not the world necessarily, it doesn't have to be that big, but whatever it is that you're in. Focus on that, try to make a good difference, be empathetic, understand how other people feel. It's not just about you and your feelings. 
try to understand where everyone's coming from. You may not like where they're coming from. You may like it. You may learn. I don't know what it is, but try to approach it that way. And if you find that why, and that why tells you I'll go into public service because I'm really committed to changing a few things, then remember that's 10% of the business. The other 90% is actually making it happen. And that is a really, really tough job. You have to find allies. You have to know exactly how you want, you know, what needs to be done. I want to, homeless, homelessness is a big issue here in, in Los Angeles. So have to do with homelessness. Okay, so that's your why. Let's say it burns you up. Great. Uh, what are you going to do about it? Uh, it's not that easy, right? There may be 10 or 15 different ideas of why the problem exists. You know, do, do you, do you attack, attack the root causes first? Do you attack the actual problem first, and then you go to the root causes? Can you ever do A without B or B without A? And then, you know, do you even agree on what the root causes are, what the actual solutions are? But let's say you find all that, that's your 10%. Then try to make whatever it is happen, that's your 90%. So if your why allows you to get there and dedicate whatever it is that you're doing, whatever your profession you choose in the end of the day to, to do it right, then go for it, really go for it. Uh, if not, go for something else. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I, was, I went to law school, right, here in the States. So I, I did my undergrad. I did a triple major. It was economics, political science, and psychology. What do you get from this? I had no idea what I want to do with my life. So, of course, what do I do after that? I go to law school because... Uh, you know, it allowed me to, uh, just a bunch of, of doors, of doors that, you know, that, that, that were, were open there for me. I, I eventually landed in things, but I always changed. I changed jobs as well, as you see. Don't be rooted in one thing. Allow yourself, if you have the luxury to, if you can, right? But luxury, what the luxury means, I mean, you create that luxury for yourself, really. Um, allow yourself that capacity to have an open mind and an open heart, and maybe, maybe, maybe you'll be happy. Uh, I want to applaud after every one of your responses, so thank you for that one as well. Uh, so I want to hear from your question, your questions. Uh, if you can, raise your hand, I'll call on you, and then for the sake of amplification, I will repeat your question. So. Uh, that's that's the plan. Anyone well, want you don't to have to repeat the question, but shout, guys, <laughs> unless you need to do it for the camera. But go ahead. Okay, go uh, here in the in second row. Go ahead. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. My question relates to the ICC, as it's been in the news lately. Uh, do you think that it is a possible future for the U.S. to agree to the Rome uh, Statute, and in what circumstances could this happen? Uh, it's it's a really tough question, and and there are and there are great scholars out there, legal scholars in the U.S. who are debating and have debated in the past. Um, I certainly think that the U.S. joining the ICC um, would be a um, and the full jurisdiction would be a huge boost to um, uh, international criminal jurisdiction around uh, around the world. Uh, the U.S even though not a member, in most instances um, is very supportive of the ICC. But it's a different thing to do that and a different thing to actually be a member of the ICC. In the European Union, we have a prerequisite for countries to join us, which is that they have to join the Rome Statute. So countries cannot come and become full members of the EU unless they also become full members of their own statute. We feel very strongly about the necessity of criminal accountability. And keep in mind, the ICC was basically a court created by the world. Uh, at that time, it was, um, you know, I remember what a leadership role Africa held in African countries, because they felt um, and they had seen in their history and in their day-to-day -day reality uh, massive violations of, uh, of um, you know, and uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity and all those things. So, um, but do I see it happening? I, you know, it's an international treaty, uh, and uh, and um, it requires congressional um, ratification. So, do I see it happening? I will not answer that question. I mean, I, I, I just know the, the, the legal processes and political processes that, that the country has to go uh, to accede to any international treaty. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's your name? Avery. 
Avery, okay, thank you for that. If you can't just uh, say your, uh, your, your name as well uh, when you ask your question, go ahead over there. David Schlossberg, uh, in the law school. Um, I, I appreciate the question about the ICC, and I guess it's somewhat related, um, because when I first read about the ICC issuing this warning, I was like, oh, that's really interesting, good for them, but then, you know, then I remember that the U.S. is a part of it, and Ukraine isn't either, so I think, my question is actually about um, human rights, and I think it's a very important topic, um, but um, I think some of it is more aspirational than reality. So my question is twofold. One, what, um, how can we talk about universal human rights when the UN doesn't even have like an identity system, really, for anyone to go get one, when they, an identity, legal identity when they need it, to move around and have some of these rights? Like so. And then secondly, why doesn't the UN or maybe the EU, after all these histories of wars and we have too, um, isn't there like a UN fund so that there's an independent, truly independent court that can win if you have a dispute like Ukraine and Russia and stuff like this? It's not one side always complaining about the other side. There's no independent court to like say you're a farmer or you've been harmed, all the people that have been harmed in Ukraine, they don't really have a place to go to make claims right now to, you know, to get damages and things like that. And this happens in every war. So it, should there be like a... Well, there, there, there are a number... It's, it's a very good question. There, there, there are a number of uh, regional human rights courts, of course. Uh, the, the European Court of Human Rights is one, but Africa has its own human rights court. Latin America has its own human rights court. There are at different levels of... Uh, of um, um, development and, and capacity to actually adjudicate issues, but, uh, but, uh, but they are there. Uh, there's always an issue of jurisdiction in any court, including a U.S. court among American citizens. Does a court have particular jurisdiction or not? And so uh, we have an international court as well, of course, the International Court of Justice, uh, in which, uh, you know, countries can go, but not it's not a citizen court, whereas the other courts, the human rights courts, are courts where citizens, certainly in Europe, can go directly uh, after the exhaustion of the national jurisdiction. So. There are, there, there are many elements uh, there. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to, uh, uh, to Putin himself, um, I would say that um, um, right now there is a, a, there's a warrant out by the ICC, and that means fundamentally that, uh, at least in theory, the 130 countries that have signed the ICC statute, if Putin were to go to those countries, have to arrest him, have to arrest him. And, uh, and we'll see if that happens. There are far more questions than we have time for, uh, and I'm realizing now we're right on the time where we have to end. If you are in the room, stick around. Ambassador Lambrinidis has already agreed to stay a little bit after, but we will close the transmission for our video and podcast series. So with that, for the purpose of our virtual audience, I want to just sign off. And I first want to thank all of you for attending in person, for attending virtually, and listening on the Bully Pulpit podcast. I do want to thank the USC Dornsife Political Science and International Relations Department. I want to thank Dr. Allison Rentel and this must-read book, Human Rights, a International Human Rights, a Survey. I do want to thank the Consul General of Lithuania for joining us uh, today as well. I want to thank California's second gentleman uh, for joining us here today, Mr. Marcus Kunlakis. I do want to thank my colleagues at the USC Center for the Political Future for organizing for today's event. Thank you super much. I do want to thank our friends, co-sponsors, the Pacific Council uh, for participating today. I do want to thank our friends at the delegation of the European Union to the United States of America. And finally, to His Excellency Stavros Lambrinidis, thank you very much. Uh, our next Bully Pulpit ep podcast episode will be for the Sunday, March 26th event. It's for our event with U.S. Congressman Dan Goldman. You're, of course, all welcome to come to that. Congressman Goldman, a Democrat from New York, representing the Southern Manhattan, Northern Brooklyn, is going to be here uh, to participate in the Warshaw Lecture. This is a lecture about Jewish values and faith in American public life. So to everyone, once again, thank you and good night.